Oh, good Monday morning, everyone. How's it going? Uh, we are in for a light show. There is a storm that's moving through right now. It is not supposed to end until uh, about 8 o'clock. It is uh, coming up on 4 o'clock now. It's 3.40. And it's more concentrated just to the south of us, which is kind of where we're headed. So... Uh, it's going to be a nice show, for sure. And I've always loved thunderstorms, always. I think they're fun, especially at night, because it sometimes really lights up the sky. And, I don't know, I just think it's pretty cool. Um, ever since I was a kid, I've always loved fun thunderstorms. Though one of my earliest memories uh, was actually being afraid of a thunderstorm. Um, I was probably, gosh, I must have been four years old, maybe. And there was a, like a tornado warning. And my mom was home. My dad worked at GM second shift at the time. And it was late at night. It must have been past bedtime. It was dark because we were in bed. And I remember being woke up by my mom, my sister and I. My sister was two years younger than me. I remember being woke up and she told us that we all need to go to the basement. My mom stayed up late, usually always, but back then you either got your information from the radio or you got it from the TV so she must have been either listening to the radio or watching TV at the time we didn't have cable uh, my dad had an over-the-air antenna one of those uh, that was uh, it was on top of the house it was a little tower and he could rotate it, which I thought was just the coolest thing ever. Um, so she must have been either watching the TV or listening to the radio, and there was a tornado warning. I don't know, and I don't remember if there were actually sirens. I would assume that there were sirens, but I don't remember hearing any. But I just remember being in the basement while... We could hear thunder and saw that was really cool. I don't know if you can see that on camera. There was like a bolt of lightning that went through that cloud up ahead. That was pretty cool. Um, but uh, yeah, I just remember sitting in the basement and just being scared. Lightning all around, thunder all around possible tornado I didn't understand what a tornado was but you know my mom you know <laughs> she she's like a tornado can blow a house over so the best place to be is in the basement um, that I got all scared blow the house over <laughs> but yeah earliest memory of a <laughs> thunderstorm um, seemingly since then I always enjoyed thunderstorms in fact I specifically remember um, it must have been first grade maybe second grade I think it was second grade because it was Mr. Smythe's class so there was a big thunderstorm that was rolling through and I just thought it was the coolest thing you know I just um I'm like, oh, this is this is really cool. So I must have been about six, maybe seven. And it got really, really dark outside. And there was thunder, there was lightning. And then um, the tornado siren went off. Um, in those days, at least for that school, if there was a tornado, they would sound the fire alarm during a, a tornado warning. So, rather than run outside, which 
can probably be a bit confusing because what if there happens to be a fire at the same time there's a tornado? You run out of the building, you know, whatever. But, you know, the teachers were pretty well in charge back then. And, um, well, good Monday morning, everyone. How's it going? Uh, we are in for a light show. There is a storm that's moving through right now. It is not supposed to end until uh, about eight o'clock. It is uh, coming up on four o'clock now. It's 3.40. And it's more concentrated just to the south of us, which is kind of where we're headed. So, uh, it's gonna be a nice show, for sure. And I've always loved thunderstorms, always. I think they're fun, especially at night, because it sometimes really lights up the sky. And I don't know, I just think it's pretty cool. Um, ever since I was a kid, I've always loved fun thunderstorms. Though one of my earliest memories uh, was actually being afraid of a thunderstorm. Um, I was probably. Gosh, I must have been four years old, maybe. And there was a, like a tornado warning. And my mom was home. My dad worked at GM second shift at the time. And it was late at night. It must have been past bedtime. It was dark because we were in bed. And I remember being woke up by my mom my sister and I, my sister was two years younger than me. I remember being woke up and she told us that we all need to go to the basement. My mom stayed up late, usually always, but back then you either got your information from the radio or you got it from the TV. So she must have been either listening to the radio or watching TV. At the time, we didn't have cable. Uh, my dad had an over-the-air antenna, one of those uh, that was, uh, it was on top of the house, it was a little tower, and he could rotate it, which I thought was just the coolest thing ever. Um, so she must have been either watching the TV or listening to the radio, and there was a tornado warning. I don't know, and I don't remember if there were actually sirens. I would assume that there were sirens, but I don't remember hearing any. But I just remember being in the basement while we could hear thunder and saw that was really cool. I don't know if you could see that on camera. There was like a bolt of lightning that went through that cloud up ahead. That was pretty cool. Um, but uh, yeah, I just remember sitting in the basement and just being scared. Lightning all around, thunder all around, possible tornado. I didn't understand what a tornado was, but you know, my mom, you know, <laughs> she, she's like, a tornado can blow a house over, so the best place to be is in the basement. Um, then I got all scared. Blow the house over? <laughs> But, yeah, earliest memory of a <laughs> thunderstorm. Um, but seemingly since then, I always enjoyed thunderstorms. In fact, I specifically remember um, it must have been first grade, maybe second grade. I think it was second grade because it was Mr. Smythe's class. So, there was a big thunderstorm that was rolling through and I just thought it was the coolest thing you know I just um, I'm like oh this is this is really cool so I must have been about six maybe seven and it got really really dark outside and there was thunder there was lightning and then um, the tornado siren 
went off. Um, in those days, at least for that school, if there was a tornado, they would sound the fire alarm during a, a tornado warning. So, rather than run outside, which can probably be a bit confusing because what if there happens to be a fire at the same time there's a tornado? You run out of the building, you know, whatever. But, you know, the teachers were pretty well in charge back then. And, um, I remember we all ran to the hallway and three quarters of the kids were crying they were all in the hallway crying and I'm just I, all I'm wanting to do is go outside and I remember thinking to myself in my head I hope it turns out to be a fire so we can go outside and watch the tornado so I was just looking out I, I really remember that classroom wasn't too far from the external doors <laughs> I remember looking out, hoping to see a glimpse of the tornado. Um, but, like I said, oh, half the other kids were crying, and and I'm just absolutely amazed. I'm not crying at all. I'm just wanting to go out there and be in the action. <laughs> it's so funny how that how that was back then. Um, so I've always been fascinated with storms in general. As I get older, of course, I understand the risks and, you know, tornadoes are obviously destructive and, I mean, I knew they were back then, but didn't understand the, the monetary aspect of it where you could lose your house or barn or whatever. But uh, back then I didn't, care so I wanted to see them um, the closest I actually ever came to an actual tornado uh, was when we lived out in the country when I was about I think I was eight eight nine years old around that time and it was during the day and there was a funnel cloud that was forming um, behind us on the, that we lived, um, there was a 200 acre farm that was behind us. And we, um, they, we had cable TV obviously and we were watching some show and then the local news interrupted the show for all the radar and so on like that we were sitting there watching it as normal the <clears throat> the weathercaster newscaster whatever would always say you know if you're in this area this town this whatever you know you should be seeking shelter at this time because it's moving in your direction it's going to be there soon things like that so um, we were sitting there watching and they had the you know back then it wasn't as sophisticated you know this would be late 80s very early 90s it wasn't as sophisticated as now but they would say things like and this here looks like wow that was a nice lightning bolt this here looks like the formation of we, we have rotation or something like that. They would say things like that. So those who are in this area and they would say the time and whatever, seek shelter immediately. And they would basically just follow the track of wherever the possible tornado was at. The weird thing is, is it wasn't raining at all. That was what I found strange. It's because we, I, we my sister and I kept going out to the front porch and it's like, wow, it's not even raining at all, but the clouds are extremely dark, it's windy. And we kept walking to the front porch, and nothing. Well, my dad was home. 
excuse me I'm trying to think I don't remember my mom being there I don't know if she was maybe possibly at work I don't remember but I know my dad was home well in that house that was out in the country it had a, a crawl space for a basement it was I don't know maybe oh I can't remember but it was a crawl space so it must have been between three and four feet tall um, and I remember that um, the, the so-called tornado was directly in our path and they were saying anybody who's in this area of Holt seek shelter immediately I remember we all ran to the hallway and like three quarters of the kids were crying they were all in the hallway crying and I'm just I, all I'm wanting to do is go outside and I remember thinking to myself in my head I hope it turns out to be a fire so we can go outside and watch the tornado so I was just looking out I, I really remember that classroom wasn't too far from the external doors I remember looking out hoping to see a glimpse of the tornado um, but like I said oh, half the other kids were crying and and I'm just absolutely amazed I'm not crying at all I'm just wanting to go out there and be in the action <laughs> it's so funny how that how that was back then um, so I've always been fascinated with storms in general as I get older of course I understand the risks and you know tornadoes are obviously destructive and I mean I knew they were back then but didn't understand the the monetary aspect of it where you could lose your house or barn or whatever but uh, back then I didn't care so I wanted to see them um, the closest I actually ever came to an actual tornado uh, was when we lived out in the country when I was about I think I was eight eight nine years old around that time and it was during the day and there was a funnel cloud that was forming um, behind us on the that we lived um, there was a 200 acre farm that was behind us and we um, they we had cable TV obviously and we were watching some show and then the local news interrupted the show for all the radar and so on like that we were sitting there watching it as normal the <clears throat> the weathercaster newscaster whatever would always say you know if you're in this area this town this whatever you know you should be seeking shelter at this time because it's moving in your direction it's gonna be there soon things like that so um, we were sitting there watching and they had the you know back then it wasn't as sophisticated you know this would be late 80s very early 90s it wasn't as sophisticated as now but they would say things like and this here looks like wow that was a nice lightning bolt this here looks like the formation of we, we have rotation or something like that they would say things like that so those who are in this area and they would say the time and whatever seek shelter immediately and they would basically just follow the track of wherever the possible tornado was at the weird thing is is it wasn't raining at all that was what I found strange it's because we I we my sister and I kept going out to the front porch 
And it's like, wow, it's not even raining at all, but the clouds are extremely dark. It's windy. And we kept walking to the front porch and nothing. Well, my dad was home. Ugh, excuse me. I'm trying to think. I don't remember my mom being there. I don't know if she was maybe possibly at work. I don't remember, but I know my dad was home. Well, in that house that was out in the country, it had a, a crawl space for a basement. It was, I don't know, maybe, oh, I can't remember, but it was a crawl space, so it must have been between three and four feet tall. Um, and I remember that um, the, the so-called tornado was directly in our path. And they were saying, anybody who's in this area of Holt, seek shelter immediately. So, we went back outside. And we were looking around, we didn't see anything. And then, it's we started hearing this, like, it was a weird sound. It was like a, a howl, but it was really deep. It was a very deep howl. It wasn't like a whistle. It was like a deep howl sound. And it was real faint. And it was off in the distance. And we just kept looking around like, where's that sound coming from? And it was windy, yes, but it wasn't like, like Wizard of Oz windy where suddenly everything starts blowing sideways. Um, and we just happened to go, we went and looked out the back window, that farm field that was behind us, and off into the distance, probably a hundred acres back, <clears throat> we saw a really thin, very thin funnel that was on the ground, and it was moving across the field east to west. <laughs> or maybe in west to east, I can't remember. But it was moving across the field, and that's where the howl sound was coming from. But the really weird part about it is it didn't seem like it was ultra windy or anything. As a matter of fact, my dad, yeah, okay, so my dad went out back with us because my sister yelled, tornado, and we're standing there, and my dad, had the access door to the crawl space open and we were standing out back and we were watching this thing go across the field and it was moving pretty fast um, I was actually kind of surprised at how fast it was moving across this field and it was just this low humming howl sound it was really weird but like I said you know it was windy but it wasn't so windy like Wizard of Oz windy it was just kind of windy but it wasn't it wasn't like blow you over windy or anything but the tornado must have been I mean it was towards the back of that property there were no trees behind our house so we could see the whole thing because it was all open farm field and it was near the back of that field. So in that farm field, it was around 200 acres. Um, I think it was about square or rectangular or whatever, but it was, it was a pretty good distance, but we were watching this funnel go across the farm field, almost perfectly along the farm field line, like the back of the property. So, We just kind of stand there in awe, getting ready to head to the basement if needed, if it changes directions or something else like that. And eventually it 
got uh, to where we couldn't see it anymore, but we could still hear that howl, weird howl sound. So back then we didn't have smartphones, we didn't have cameras. I mean, yeah, you had cameras, but my dad didn't have a camera. So um, he did have a Polaroid, but I don't think it had any film. And that was a neat one. And so it wasn't like we could get our phones out or cameras out and start taking pictures of it. So I wish that I did have a camera and a shot of that because that was a very unique experience for me. But no, nope, don't have any photo proof, video proof, none of that. I wish I did. Not that I needed to prove it or anything, but it'd be nice to go back and look at that. But since then, that was the only actual tornado that I've ever seen with my own eyes. I've seen somewhat of a formation starting of a tornado, but never touching down. Where the funnel started to kind of make, you know, it would kind of make um, a funnel heading down a little bit from the cloud, but never never made it into anything I've seen a few of those but I've actually never seen a tornado since then an actual actual funnel that's moving across or wherever um, I find them fascinating so we went back outside we're looking around, we didn't see anything. And then it's we started hearing this like it was a weird sound. It was like a, a howl, but it was really deep. It was a very deep howl. It wasn't like a whistle. It was like a deep howl sound. And it was real faint. And it was off in the distance. And we just kept looking around, like, where's that sound coming from? And it was windy, yes, but it wasn't like like Wizard of Oz windy where suddenly everything starts blowing sideways. Um, and we just happened to go, we went and looked out the back window, that farm field that was behind us, and off into the distance, probably 100 acres back, <clears throat> we saw a really thin very thin funnel that was on the ground and it was moving across the field east to west or maybe in west to east I can't remember but it was moving across the field and that's where the howl sound was coming from but the really weird part about it is it didn't seem like it was ultra windy or anything as a matter of fact my dad yeah okay so my dad went out back with us because my sister yelled tornado and we're standing there and my dad had the access door to the crawl space open and we were standing out back and we were watching this thing go across the field and it was moving pretty fast um, I was actually kind of surprised at how fast it was moving across this field. And it was just this low humming howl sound. It was really weird. But like I said, you know, it was windy, but it wasn't so windy like Wizard of Oz windy. It was just kind of windy, but it wasn't... It wasn't like blow you over windy or anything, but the tornado must have been, I mean, it was towards the back of that property. There were no trees behind our house, so we could see the whole thing because it was all open farm field and it was near the back of that field. So, and that farm field was around 200 acres. Um, I think it was about square or rectangular or whatever, but it was, it was a pretty good distance, but we were watching this funnel go across the farm field almost perfectly along the farm field line like the back of the property 
So we just kind of stand there in awe, getting ready to head to the basement if needed, if it changes directions or something else like that. And eventually it got uh, to where we couldn't see it anymore. But we could still hear that howl, weird howl sound. So back then we didn't have smartphones, we didn't have cameras. I mean, yeah, you had cameras, but my dad didn't have a camera. So um, he did have a Polaroid, but I don't think it had any film. And that was a neat one. And so it wasn't like we could get our phones out or cameras out and start taking pictures of it. So I wish that I did have a camera and a shot of that because that was a very unique experience for me. But no, nope, don't have any photo proof, video proof, none of that. I wish I did. Not that I needed to prove it or anything, but it'd be nice to go back and look at that. But since then, that was the only actual tornado that I've ever seen with my own eyes. I've seen somewhat of a formation starting of a tornado, but never touching down. Where the funnel started to kind of make, you know, it would kind of make um, a funnel heading down a little bit from the cloud, but never never made it into anything I've seen a few of those but I've actually never seen a tornado since then an actual actual funnel that's moving across or wherever um, I find them fascinating Ooh, excuse me the, the storm woke me up early so I haven't been able to I've been up since about two. So, um, yeah, tornadoes have always fascinated me, but I completely understand their destructive power and so on. Um, they're quite amazing. Quite amazingly destructive. And we're actually pretty fortunate to be in an area that we don't experience tornadoes like they do down south. You know, and I guess the, what do they call it, Tornado Alley is moving, I think, southeast. So it used to be Kansas, Oklahoma, that area for tornadoes is now down towards, I think, Louisiana, maybe. Um, Alabama, Louisiana are seeing more uh, on an uptick. Tennessee, Kentucky. But, uh, now as far as lightning strikes go, you know, you always hear lightning around, right? Or thunder, that is. But how close are you to an actual lightning strike? Well, just recently, as a matter of fact, lightning struck just across the street from us in the field, the cornfield that's right across the street from us. I actually captured it on video, not the lightning strike itself. Um, you couldn't see it wasn't in frame, but we have cameras on our barn. I've got six cameras on the barn that watch the barn and the livestock around. And um, maybe someday I'll get into the story as far as why I had to put those cameras up. What the frick? Freaking bird. But... Um, so it was one that obviously woke the entire house up it was about I don't know two in the morning and it was like a loud crash it was right across the street so super loud crash and I um, got it on camera because I went and played it back and the instant that you see the light, you hear the crash. So that was enough to wake everybody up. <clears throat> when I was in Disney World, when I was 17, 
<clears throat> we took a trip to Disney with family. We are at, um, it was not Magic Kingdom. Um, it was the, gosh. It was the place with all the arcade machines. Um, I can't remember, honestly. I haven't been too much of a fan of Disney lately, so that's kind of been out of my memory, but um, we there was a big storm that was rolling through. This would have been in September. There was a big storm that was rolling through, and we were sitting in a sheltered area it wasn't a shelter but it was like a store and stupid raccoons so we're sitting in this kind of store shelter area and it's pouring <clears throat> there's lightning around us you know you didn't have well, I guess that was a nice bolt you didn't have smartphones back then so you could just get on your phone and see where the storm was at so we're all just kind of sitting there waiting for it to stop pouring and whatever and there was a um, a, a boat um, it looked like a um, oh those old paddle boats steamboats or whatever you call those things it was a restaurant it was quite literally um just across the walkway from us and we're facing it and all of a sudden a lightning bolt hits that boat <sighs> oh man I'm going to do this all the way all of a sudden this lightning bolt hits that and it was It was the loudest crash that, I mean, it was just, for a split second, the entire everything is bright white, right? And for a split second, you just don't know if you just got hit by lightning. And the crash sound is something that you just can't put into words. It's loud, obviously, but I remember feeling, and it could have been adrenaline or something else, but I remember feeling um, like all of the hairs on my body were all felt staticky, and they were standing up, and everybody else was feeling the same way, like, wow, the air just got charged. It was the weirdest feeling. It was the first time I'd ever been that close to lightning strikes. I mean, I've been in a in a car when there's a close lightning strike. I've been, you know, in the house when there's a close lightning strike. Um, in a building, whatever. But I've never actually been outside when a lightning strike was that close. And that was the closest I'd ever been to a lightning strike. If, um, if I'm really thinking about it, because it was just right in front of us. And I remember the storekeeper, this old, she was an elderly lady, not real old, maybe in her early 60s, mid 60s. She was facing away. She was doing something with the store. I don't know what. And she turns around and she says, how close did that get? Well, we just ha happened to be looking in that direction of that boathouse or whatever it was, that restaurant. And we're like, it hit that top, it hit the top of that boat. And she's like, wow, that's nuts. I've never seen anything like that. Seen anything? You didn't even see it. You're facing the other way. Whatever. So that storm didn't really last all that long after that. It kind of passed through, so we were able to walk. Um, maybe it was Disney Quest I can't remember but anyway they had all the Legos there they had this really cool 
um, like uh, it was a guitar player that was everything was made out of Lego and the guys um, the, the the guy that was made out of the, the Legos was playing the guitar you know and they had uh, it was like an animatronics <clears throat> kind of deal but made out of Legos it was pretty cool it was in glass and I remember at the time you know because I was all into guitar at the time I remember standing there thinking wow I want to build that I want to do exactly that and I was working at the time I had a job at the lumber yard I remember thinking oh how many weeks do I have to save up to buy something like that well it was all custom made obviously but um I was so fascinated with it that I wanted to build one myself. I was all into that for like a week. But um, that's actually the closest I've ever been to a lightning strike. Pretty neat, but scary, very scary. You know, very, very scary. Uh, I've seen the videos of the close lightning strikes. The freaking that was a good one. The freaking cow that got struck by lightning. I mean, <laughs> whatever. But I always loved storms. As a matter of fact, usually if there's ever a storm, I'm usually listening to the AM530. So, you basically hear this sound. But you hear the lightning. I'll turn it up a little more. So I've always been really geeky about this kind of stuff. I've always, um, man, there's some good strikes coming out right now. I've always been really, really geeky about electronics and radio and so on. And my, my youngest, he is also into this kind of stuff. So if there's ever a storm or whatever, we're listening to the radio. We can hear, uh, it's, you'd be surprised all the different sounds that you can hear. For example, um, there is a pump station in a town next door to us, and once in a while it turns on to fill the uh, the water tower that's across the way. And just recently, I we were trying to figure out where that sound was coming from because it was like a weird spooky sound. It was like a really loud too. We were trying to figure out where it was coming from. You're listening to AM 5:30 where you can hear all the weird crap. Because um, we're not anywhere near a 5.30 station. And I posted a clip finally on my Ham Radio for Beginner uh, Facebook group. And they, they're like, you know what? That kind of sounds like a AC motor starting up. And then one guy asked if there was a water tower nearby. when, Because you would only hear it in a certain spot. And I said, yeah, there is. There. As a matter of fact, there's a water tower nearby. And he's like, well, it's probably the pump for the water tower kicking on when the water tower gets to a certain level. And sure enough, that's what it was. And we found the pump station. And we're parked out next to the pump station. And sure enough, that's where the sound was coming from. So I thought that was pretty cool. But that's stuff that you can hear on the AM radio, not necessarily 5.30, but it seems like you hear it the best on 5.30. So things like lightning, you can actually hear over the 5.30. So all that blotchy static that you're hearing that happens coincides with like that. That's lightning strike. You know, it it gets picked up by the radio. And 
so if I wasn't doing this video right now, that's what I would be listening to the whole way. I'm geeky like that. I really badly want to get into ham radio, actually get into it. But I have this weird minimum entry, and I shouldn't be this way. I already know I shouldn't, but I want to experience it the way that I want to experience it. And I know it builds character to experience it like everybody else, but I want a transceiver that actually has a, um, a band scope with a waterfall. You know, like a 7300 or something like that. Deer on the move. That almost looked like a buck. Um, I want one of those so that I can sit there and go through 20 meters or 80 meters or whatever and find where people are actually talking. The old school way is to just take the dial and just spin it until you hear something. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But me being an electronic geek and newer and and maybe you can call it lazier but I like to actually see the entire band and then see where the spikes are at and then move to those spikes I've got an SDR radio that's attached to my laptop and that's what I do I sit there you know usually with my son because he's all into that too I sit there and I look for the spikes and then I tune in to those spikes and I hear the conversation that's going on. That's what I do. Um, so, the, uh, oh, excuse me, the ham radio for beginning beginners, there's a lot of those groups, but the group that I happen to be in, you know, they're, they're always talking about cost, a uh, low cost entry options like some basic radio with just a basic LCD number display on it with nothing else and using that and that's fine there's nothing wrong with that but I want to sit there and actually see the band so I've been kind of holding off because of that because you know the cheapest 7300 out there, you know, on Facebook used is like 750 bucks. So I've been kind of holding off because of that. Plus, heh, again, me, my minimum entry, <clears throat> um, I want to put up a 20 meter Yagi. I have a 44, no, a 50 foot, um, telescoping tower that I want to put up on the back of the property and I want to put a 20 meter Yagi on it and I want to be able to listen to all the signals far and wide and I have experimented obviously with different quote unquote 20 meters I had a uh, was an FMJ 20 meter uh, dipole and those are great and all that but we are surrounded at least on our property by farmland yes but trees I, I strung like a 500 foot um, electric fence wire across the property tried to get it up into the trees and so on I was able to pick up more signals but also a lot more static so I want to get uh, a Yagi that's tuned for 20 meters that's elevated up above the tree lines. You know, we've got 100 foot trees. So my 50 foot tower wouldn't be tall enough to get over those trees, but um, it would stand a better chance than some wire that I've got strung across, you know, ladder height. It would do a lot better than that. But that's what I want. And I know that it's ridiculous. And a lot of people are like, oh, go to 70 meters. You could have this little bitty coffee can for an antenna. And you could put it in your attic. And nobody would even know. And it works great. Yeah, I understand. But I'm way more fascinated with um, 20 meters and 80 meters. We get a lot of people on 80 meters around this area. And 20 meters, obviously, during the day. 
and that's what I'm really wanting to get into but you know like I said getting the tower up and so on like that and I need to get my license obviously there's no point in getting a transceiver if I can't transmit legally so I want to get my license but all in due time I guess I would actually like to build my own little radio shack slash hunting shack um, but that's for a different time in my life for sure that way it's far away from the house and noise and things like that but I've always been into that radio stuff always always ever since I was little and EMF and all that other stuff I've always been fascinated with all the different electronics that we have that just just blast out EMF different noise and things like that I've just always been fascinated and being able to talk to people across the world wow that's just awesome yeah you can do that with a phone but just randomly picking up conversations and talking with people all over the world to me is sounds really it just it's just a cool concept um Anyway, I gotta get gas, of course. You know, I've got a quarter tank, and I don't like getting gas on the way home. It's way busier. So, I'm gonna pause the video here. It looks like the storm is definitely moving in a different direction, but. Uh, I'm gonna pause the video here and get some gas, grab something to drink, maybe a snack, and I'll be back in just a second. funny the same people the same people coming here every day at the exact same time every day the same people I see the exact same people every day exact same time I need to get a speedy reward card. I think I mentioned that last time. I should probably really consider that because I stop here uh, probably every other day to get gas and a snack or something. I could be earning free gas or something. My ex-wife was all into that speedy reward stuff. She would she would drive ten miles extra to stop at a speedway for their um, speedy rewards so <laughs> that was her but uh, let's see I left off on ham radios and yeah I I it's fascinating because I always hear, I don't know much about amateur radio. Honestly, I just don't. But I do know I was at a, uh, a ham radio convention. It was about six, seven years ago, maybe. It was when I was first. I mean, I've always been aware of amateur radio, but never really knew anything about it. But it was around the time that I was first really being interested in the hobby uh, and I went to a convention it was like a swap meet or something uh, it was advertised uh, on the radio of all places and I'm like you know that actually sounds like a lot of fun I'm just really interested in the hobby and you know I don't know maybe I, mean, I didn't have any money at the time. I was still paycheck to paycheck. And this was probably six, seven years ago. So I decided, hey, I'm just going to go there and just kind of look around and just see what's all there. Maybe talk to some people. And I swear it, other than the occasional kid. Wow, that was a cool strike going across the clouds. Other than the occasional kid. Everybody there was, I would say, minimum 50. Average, 
60. You know, old guys. Middle-aged, 50s and 60s and 70s. And like I said, there was the occasional grandkid running around. But they weren't there for the hobby. They were just there probably because the grandparents were babysitting them or something. But they were all older guys. And let's see, I would have been in my mid-30s at the time. And I'm just kind of walking around looking at stuff. And, you know, they would... The guys that were sitting at the tables and so on, they'd be like, hey, how's it going? They're all nice. All of them. 100%. And... I would usually say things like, because I didn't want to strike up a conversation because I felt really out of place because I didn't know anything about anything. So I wasn't I wasn't wanting to strike up the conversation. And for other reasons, I think I had something else going on that same day, so I didn't want to get caught up in some long drawn out, this is how you get into ham radio and this is the radio. I didn't, I didn't want to get caught up in it. I was just there to look around. Um, and maybe listen in and drop in on other conversations that were going on. That's what I was there for. I wasn't there to buy anything. I wasn't there to learn, you know, get an hour long from the obvious experts, the guys that are very passionate. I'm not, you know, putting them down in any way. Passionate about the hobby, knowledgeable, want to share the information want younger people in it but I wasn't ready to get caught up in that I was just there to kind of look around see what it was all about they had different clubs that were there um, they were doing um, outside it was it was at a it was at a school I think so outside they had stations set up, which I thought were so cool. So they had these telescoping antennas that they would crank up, crank up antenna. And they were making contacts and I was absolutely fascinated, but I didn't want to get sucked in. Cause again, I had something going on that day. I don't know if it was a doctor's appointment or something else. So I didn't want to get all caught up and then be rude and be like, hey, sorry, I gotta go. Or get caught with one person who would tell me all about the hobby for two hours and then I wouldn't get to see anything else. So I was just kind of walking around, looking at radios, looking at the different microphones, and my God, those guys. I mean, I didn't know much about it at all then. I don't really know much about it now as far as the technical aspects of it or each radio. But some of those guys, they had, there was this one guy he had an older, I, I don't know if it was an ICOM or whatever. It was an older radio. It was massive. I mean, it was just huge. And he had this sign that was next to it that described all of it. It was not for sale. He was just there to show it off, which was cool because it was probably a ten thousand dollar radio at that point this huge radio and all just it had probably 200 different buttons and dials and everything on it um and it was just the neatest thing and i'm then all these guys were gathered around it talking about it and he was sitting there at his table talking about it and just really cool and the great thing about that what i was picking up on when i was there was that none of the guys were like, you know what, I'm better than you. I know more than you. You know, I am superior. The guys were all, you know, various levels of ham radio licenses and so on like that. And they were sharing their passion for the hobby. They weren't talking down to people. They weren't gatekeeping. None of that stuff. And that's what I found so welcoming that I wanted to stay and talk, but I just, like I said, I had something else going on and I really, that was a nice bolt. I really didn't want to get sucked in. I wanted to get sucked in, but at the time I didn't have time to get sucked in. I was literally there, I think for about an hour and I had something else going on. 
So I just kind of wandered through, looked at things, a couple guys, yeah, they say, hey, how's it going? You know, I'm like, good, and you know, I would try not to strike up a conversation. I wasn't trying to be rude, but um, I, I knew from the get-go that those guys were incredibly passionate about the hobby and I didn't want to get sucked in <laughs> at the time. So, pretty neat. Um, I enjoyed it. And that's when I, whatever the fuck that was. Shit. I don't know what, I hope that was just a, tree branch I felt it in the floor whatever it was it came up and hit the uh, floorboard um, I didn't see what it was I'll have to look on camera when I'm gonna get the tire monitor out uh, keep an eye on that just in case it pierce the tire or whatever it was that I hit <sighs> man there's just enough traffic on the road to not be able to use brights it is a Monday oh that reminds me I gotta message my wife and tell her she's gotta take the trash to the road I totally forgot I was gonna do it and I forgot um <clears throat> but Keeping an eye on that tire pressure monitor now. Um, so yeah, I I see the appeal, and it's a shame that and the the radio the hobby isn't dying. That's that's people on the internet are so dramatic. Like, oh, ham radio is dying. Ham radio is dead. When you compare it to its peak, when amateur radio was about the only long distance communication that you could have yeah it it's had way more people but you know communications have changed we've got the internet we've got cell phones so we can easily communicate and companies use you know private networks and things like that so they don't need to communicate over the air like that anymore um, my dad's old work um, he was a cement mixer driver they used CB radio channel 40 to communicate and they had basically an illegal setup because all of the trucks had 120 watt amplifiers so that they could reach out far enough. And they were always on channel 40. And I don't think you were allowed to use CB for business communications. I could be wrong, but they did it anyway and at the time at least I don't know if they do at all even now but at the time the uh, FCC didn't really care all that much or they didn't have enough manpower to be able to do anything about it so the concrete place would communicate over channel 40 with they had 120 watt amplifiers in each of the trucks so that they could communicate. Well, then they eventually went to, I think, a UHF or a, a VHF system. But that was like, you know, that was the early days of that concrete place. So they were being cheap. They didn't have a lot of money. My dad was there pretty early in the company's starting. So that's what they used. And uh, I got into CB radio around the same time my dad was talking about it. I got into CB radio hard back in uh, let's see it would have been the mid 90s hard I uh, 
got a it was like a Cobra 29 classic it was a used it was at a garage sale kind of deal the Cobra 29 classic and um, my dad set up a uh, a whip antenna for me I had my bedroom when we lived in the trailer park my bedroom was in the back corner and I, there was a exit door it was like the the rear door of the house was through my bedroom so my dad set up a whip antenna mounted it to the gable of the roof of the house and had a whip antenna coming in he drilled a hole in the wall just for me and all this other shit so that I could sit there and listen to CB radio and I uh, was so into it there was a save a lot warehouse just down the road from us it was a save a lot warehouse so there were trucks coming and going constantly and I would be sitting there on channel 19 listening to these guys talk just listening to them talk they were not only talking with the drivers so the warehouse worker would say hey you know dock this dock that whatever but they were also communicating with drivers who were on the road because occasionally I mean again this is back before smartphones GPS systems and so on maybe they had Tom Toms back then but they must have been prohibitively expensive you know this would have been mid 90s like I said around 95 so I don't know if they had GPS back then. I know they had GPS in existence, but I don't know if they actually had the portable ones with the LCD screens you could mount to your window. But, uh, so, they would sometimes have drivers that would come in from the highway. The highway was about, oh, roughly two miles from the Save-A-Lot warehouse. So they would have drivers who would quite literally get on the radio and say, save a lot warehouse, you got a copy. Uh, break one nine, save a lot warehouse, you got a copy. And then the guy at the warehouse would respond and they'd be like, hey, uh, where do I need to turn to get down? Cause it was, it was on Depot Street, but it was like weird. It was in a weird area. So it was kind of hard to find unless you knew exactly where it was. So quite often drivers would ask for directions to get there. And I would sit there and I would listen to them. And I remember being so excited to get home from school and go straight to my room, turn on that radio and listen. Just listen. And once in a while would do a radio check and the warehouse guy was the, the always the one that would respond to the radio check. Break one nine for radio check. It worked good there, driver. Occasionally he would get into a fight with somebody. Um, I specifically remember a driver must have went to the wrong door or something. And the, the warehouse guy was chewing him out. And the driver was chewing him out. And they were going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth calling each other names and all this other shit it was really funny and I'm sitting there listening to that my dad came in the room I think I yell at him I'm like hey listen to this so I uh, yelled at him to come listen and we we're sitting there listening to these two guys go at it over the radio and then other people who could hear them from the highway would chime in and tell them to go get a room and all this other stuff it was hilarious it really was but uh, I had a lot of fun. I would sit in that room freaking all day after school and on weekends and whatever and just listen to the radio. It was so much fun. Then for Easter, I got a portable radio from my mom. And boy, oh boy, I fell in love with that. It was just a basic Radio Shack portable 40 channel CB radio. And I would have my sister in the bedroom 
in my bedroom while I would walk as far as I could and see, you know, I'd be on a, I'd be on like channel 40 or somewhere obscure because I didn't want to interrupt the truckers, but um, I would, uh, you know, go pretty far actually with that little radio and my, but the, you know, the whip antenna was pretty tall on the side of the house. And so it could go out pretty far. I didn't have, it was, the radio was peaked and tuned, supposedly, according to the seller at the time. But it definitely moved out, that's for sure. But um, she could hear me a lot less than I could hear her. Uh, but anyway, so that was a lot of fun. I was really into it hard, CB radio. Even in, through my early post-graduation, I had a Galaxy 979. I had a 120 watt amplifier, a Wilson 5000, and a K40 antenna. And it was awesome. Oh man, those are good, good days. Freaking good days. But anyway, I'm getting close to work, so. I uh, I'll let you guys go. Hopefully you enjoyed the light show. I certainly did. I had lots of fun on this drive. Always entertaining. So I'll catch you guys on the next video for sure. Um, There's kind of going to be two videos in a row because I didn't get the other one posted over the weekend. I forgot about it. But uh, yeah, so I appreciate you joining. Lots of fun. And we will catch you guys on the next video. So have a great day, great Monday, great start of the week. Hopefully you enjoyed this. Comment if you do. Um, I'm still trying to figure out if anybody is even interested in these videos at all. So it'd be nice to get some feedback. So again, we'll catch you in the next video. Have a great Monday. Uh, and... Uh, Take care.